tonight, jokes on you. Photographic is what you said, is that right? Never appeared in your report though. Can Joe Biden laugh off the special counsel's report on classified documents? I know I don't look like it, I've been around a while. Hidden testimony. The January 6th committee didn't tell us about testimony that contradicts their star witness. The president reached up towards the front of the vehicle to grab at the steering wheel. Can we believe anything in the upcoming Trump trials? The clock is ticking for TikTok. Will Congress ban the Chinese-owned social media app after Trump says it's okay? You know, a lot of good, and there's a lot of bad with TikTok. Senator Rand Paul on Chinese spying versus free speech. If you don't like communism, you don't like people who are dealing with communists, don't deal with them. And no justice. A teenage girl clings to life. The school both sides a statement about bullying. How did bashing someone's skull in become bullying? There are reports that have come forward that the safety school resource officers aren't in the schools. Seven oh one on the East Coast with breaking news. Decision Desk HQ can now project Joe Biden will win the state of Georgia. That victory puts him over the threshold to secure the Democratic nomination for president. Not that it was in doubt, but it is now official. We'll let you know if we hear from the president this evening. Meanwhile, if Trump sweeps the primaries in Georgia, Mississippi, and Washington state, he too will wrap up enough delegates to secure the Republican nomination. That won't happen until late this evening Pacific time. Obviously, stay with News Nation for coverage throughout the night. We'll be on it. And we welcome you to the Ferris Show on television. First tonight, we have finally found an honest man in Washington. One. So we're celebrating these days. Robert Hur testified before Congress and managed to irritate both Republicans and Democrats, which is a unique feat these days, and one worth examining. Just to briefly review, Robert Hur investigated then-Vice President Biden's keeping of classified documents at his multiple homes and in multiple locations, including next to Biden's Corvette in his garage. Hur was appointed to, as a special counsel and said Biden did it but declined to prosecute. And in a report said, among other things, a jury would see Biden as, quote, a sympathetic, well-meaning elderly man with a poor memory. So, no crime. His testimony today about the report before Congress did not disappoint. You were not born yesterday. You understood exactly what you were doing. It was a choice. You certainly didn't have to include that language. You made a choice. That was a political choice. It was the wrong choice. The fact that Joe Biden is so inept in responding that you can't prove the intent, which, again, I don't quibble with that conclusion, but it's frustrating to be like, oh, well, this guy's not getting treated the same way as Trump because the elevator's not going to the top floor, so we can't prove intent. Always leave it to Matt Gates. Special counsels used to be called independent counsels. And what's more independent than having both sides upset with you? Republicans took her to task for not charging the president. Democrats chastised him for noting Biden could remember basic facts, things like the year of his son's death or what a fax machine was called. The president forgot that one twice. Again, we found an honest man in Washington. George Wills here, News Nation senior political contributor, Pulitzer Prize winning columnist. Good to see you, sir, as always. Um, Honest men are usually forgotten pretty quickly. Uh, and don't have much of a future. I feel like Mike Pence could write a book about that. Mr. Hur, it, it was an interesting case because he used to be in the public sector. He was a justice and others, but he's now in the private sector. And the stunning contrast between his polish, his demeanor, his precision, and the showboating by the his people interrogating him demonstrated the inherent and invariable superiority of the private sector to the public sector. Oh, it's, 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 it's amazing what a 15-time salary bump will do for you in the exactly. private sector, whatever, whatever job Mr. Herr will uh, depart Can to. Can you explain something to me? He, was call, he called the president sympathetic, yep. well-meaning, elderly man with a memory problem. Which one of those are people disagreeing with? I think they're disagreeing with the very point that he put them in the report. But he had to. And our shift said yeah. that it was gratuitous. It wasn't gratuitous at all. He had to explain 
his decision, which was to decline to prosecute. He said he, he violated laws, but he had to project whether this would be a pointless to put this in front of a jury. And he said yes, because he's dealing with a well-meaning, sympathetic, etc. The last time that we heard from Robert Hur was in this report where he said all of these things that were quite upsetting to then-President Biden. I was sitting on this set. It was about 7.15, 7.30. And for the first time in the Biden presidency, we got the email. The pool has been called back to the White House. The president is going to address the nation on some conceivably issue of national import. It turned out he was angry, visibly angry about the report. Take a listen. There's even reference that I don't remember when my son died. How in the hell dare he raise that? Frankly, when I was asked the question, I thought to myself, it wasn't any of their damn business. And then we saw in President Biden's testimony today that, yes, he did remember the date when his son died. He he brought it up himself. And then he did not, in fact, remember the year. Any day that is spent between now and the 5th of November talking about Mr. Biden's age is a bad day for Mr. Biden. He should drop the subject and he should not have gone out for that. that you, so you don't think we're going to see him tonight? <laughs> shouldn't. I mean, wh- how much can he take of this talk about his age? He, he had his great moment in the State of the Union where shouting was, I guess, a sign of vitality. Enough with that. Talk about something, anything else. Well, he he doesn't seem to be heeding your advice. Um, We don't know. We don't don't know if he watches. (laughs) I know the world would be a much better place if we all did. Uh, Here is Mr. Biden's latest ad. I believe the job of the president is to fight for you, the American people, and that's what I'm doing. I'm Joe Biden, and I approve this message. Can we do one more take? Look, I'm very young, energetic, and handsome. What the hell am I doing this for? It worked for Reagan. It worked for Reagan, but this looks like a knockoff of the Reagan. It's like the Rolex you buy on the corner of Elm and Green Street. Uh, Reagan had a gift for this. He did it once. He did it at a crucial moment. He did it with laughter and good spirits. This looks like someone trying over and over again to get it right. All right, so big picture here. Uh, If President Biden heeds your advice and stops talking about his age, uh, does Mr. Uh, Her's testimony not get relished to the dustbin, maybe, I mean, I don't even know if an asterisk, but the dustbin of history of honest men in Washington who come out and say what the facts are and then move on with their lives? I think so. I I think he did himself some good. There were aspersions yeah. about his motives from the Democratic side, saying he's auditioning for the Trump approval so he can become a judge. There's no basis for that. It's simply ad hominem kind of attacks, which is what you'd expect from people who don't have anything else to say. All right. Mr. Will, as always, Good pleasure. Case. Thank you, sir. More people should listen to your advice. We do, sir. <laughs> Thank you. Turns out one of the most explosive details from the January 6th committee hearings, those primetime hearings, might not be true. In fact, a member of the Secret Service offered sworn testimony that it wasn't true. And this is very important, not because we want to relitigate January 6th here. It was an awful day in the country. But because the truth matters, at least it does to us especially since President Biden bases much of his campaign around January 6th. And the Biden DOJ is prosecuting Trump over January 6th. So the truth, uh, as it always is, but especially here, is really important. The New York Times released transcripts from the driver of then-President Trump's limo on January 6th, member of the United States Secret Service, federal law enforcement officer. And that testimony contradicts this primetime testimony from Cassidy Hutchinson. Bobby responded, sir, we have to go back to the West Wing. The president reached up towards the front of the vehicle to grab at the steering wheel. Mr. Trump then used his free hand to lunge towards Bobby Angle. You might remember hearing that and then the ensuing salivating by so many that Trump could be charged with assault on a federal agent. It was proof that he had truly lost his mind. But a few months later, the January 6th committee interviewed the actual agent, the person who Trump allegedly lunged at, 
not third-hand information, not second-hand information, the actual person. And here's what the driver said. It was clear to me he wanted to go to the Capitol. I did not see him reach. He never grabbed the steering wheel. I didn't see him, you know, lunge to try to get into the front seat at all. But that very salient detail never made it in to the January 6th committee's report. The committee fawned over Hutchinson as she gave her third-hand testimony. In fact, you might remember, they called a special prime time hearing just to listen to her. It was so important. But when sworn firsthand testimony of a Secret Service agent discredited their narrative, they remained silent. They, they hid the evidence. They hid the exculpatory evidence. And even today, they doubled down. Here's our Joe Khalil with January 6th committee member Jamie Raskin. You don't think that what the Republicans put out yesterday is going to in any way um, damage the credibility of your report, of your committee work over the course of months? No, just read the report, uh, watch the video. They, you know, for a while they were trying to blame, blame it on Antifa. They were trying to blame it on the FBI. They've got to deal with the reality of what Donald Trump did. But this isn't about what Donald Trump did. This is about what the committee did. The January 6th committee told us they needed primetime hearings to tell the American people the truth. And now we learn they weren't after the truth, but rather some version of the truth to help them politically. And one can imagine the exculpatory evidence isn't going to get anywhere near the airtime that those wild accusations got. That's fine. It's not fair, but congressional hearings are political exercises. And politics isn't fair. But courts should be fair. They need to be fair. And withholding exculpatory evidence should and does get prosecutors in big trouble. They must turn it over to the defense. Let's hope those prosecuting Donald Trump follow the rules more than the January 6th committee did. It's only fair. Next, the president of ABC News won't say anything about her star anchor repeatedly shaming a rape victim by liberal commentators like George Stephanopoulos get away with the very thing social warriors battle against. What happened when you guys said goodbye to each other? It was very awkward. I actually shook his hand and I... Was he I, surprised? He was surprised and he was angry. He was just this little man standing there, this little troll he sitting there. He got up. And Senator Rand Paul on freedom versus Chinese spying. As Congress gets to set on whether to ban TikTok or not, why Paul is okay with the Chinese spying, but not the American government spying on you? All right, the House is expected to vote tomorrow on a bill that would require Chinese-based ByteDance to either sell TikTok or face the app getting banned. You may not know what TikTok is. I don't have it on my phone, but 150 million people in America use it every month. Ask your kids or grandkids to show it to you. They're on it all day long. And TikTok poses a real national security threat. It's owned by a Chinese-based company, and China requires its companies to share any data that they own with the Chinese Communist Party and its intelligence services. So about 150 million Americans, TikTok has your location, your age, your name, your password, your ID from your face, your text messages, your social media accounts, payment information, all sorts of stuff that China can get, and they can also manipulate the algorithm. It's one of the reasons why we believe so many young Americans are pro-Hamas rather than support Israel in the war. The Chinese changed the algorithm just a little bit, so the pro-Hamas stuff showed up more on TikTok. It is an incredibly powerful tool. Don't ask me, the FBI director, just talked about how big of a threat to national security TikTok really is. That kind of uh, influence operation or the different kinds of influence operations you're describing are extraordinarily difficult to detect, which is part of what makes the national security concerns represented by, uh, by TikTok so significant. And yet tomorrow's bill that could ban TikTok, to be clear, if they sell it, then it's no problem. There's some very vocal conservative opponents. 
Interestingly enough, President Trump was for banning TikTok and tried to. Now suddenly he's against it. Then there's Senator Rand Paul of Kentucky. With us now, Senator Rand Paul, author of Deception, the Great COVID Cover-Up. Senator, it's good to see you. Thank you. Um, I think the book's important. Goes through what China did. They created a virus in a lab. Charitable uh, explanation is that it escaped from the lab. Then China lied about it. They covered it up. And a million-plus Americans died. If, if they are willing to do all of that, why is it okay for China to own a company and have access to so much of the personal information and control of the phones of so many Americans through TikTok? Well, there is this little sticking point. It's called the Constitution, the Bill of Rights. You're not really allowed to take property from people in the United States uh, without due process. You have to go to court, you have to accuse them of a crime to take their property. The Fifth Amendment says you just can't take stuff from people. So the company TikTok is owned about 60% by international investors, including some Americans. So I don't know that you can take someone's property by fiat. You can't just sort of pass a law and take someone's property constitutionally. There also is the problem of the First Amendment. 180 million Americans use this social media uh, platform to express themselves. And if the uh, company is banned or you say it can't have the current ownership and the company goes away, you're basically taking their First Amendment rights away with them also. I'm no fan of the Chinese communist government. I'm the least favorite uh, person you'll ever find or the, one of the biggest critics of the Chinese government. But there's a difference between not giving them money and then an economic embargo. So while I'm not for giving China any money, giving them any research money, I'm not for uh, preventing us to, from having trade with China. Trade is largely beneficial would, to both you, countries. Uh, I, I, your, points, your points are w well taken and well made. Um, I'm not, uh, the First Amendment issue, I, I'll put aside for just one second, we'll get to it. But on the issue of ownership, um, you, you've taken a very strong line about espionage in the United States and what the government should and should not be able to do. Would you be okay with the U.S. government being able to demand um, at any time without a warrant all of the things that TikTok is, is going to be forced to hand over the Chinese, everything from people's photos on their um, phone to their location no, information? Absolute, so ab absolutely not. But, you know, TikTok is not going into your house and taking your stuff. People sign up with TikTok the same way they sign up with Google, Facebook, or any of the other big tech companies, and they do uh, all scrape your information. So if you don't like TikTok doing it, then you want to pass a law to ban it from all countries from absorbing your information, you could. But if you're going to accuse a particular company of a crime and you're going to say that they're giving it to the government of China, one, you would have to prove that. That's an accusation. That's not uh, something that's been proven by anyone. We know that the Chinese government does demand things, but we don't know that any information really is going from TikTok to any of these people in China. We do know that the company itself has offered to go through what's called the CFIUS process, where you have an American board and the company keeps all of the data in America. They've been trying to do that for over a year. So instead of people right. allowing a cooperation to occur so this company isn't disbanded by government, no one's been sort of uh, embracing the possibility that Oracle could host their data and it could be kept in Texas. No, That's what the company has offered. I, I, I understand that. I guess at the same time, a Chinese company is beholden to the Chinese Communist Party. It's not like the United States where companies are independent and you need a warrant to go get this information. Yeah, but, even, I think but even that, oh, even but, that that you're saying is, on, just, even that that you're saying, even that, even that that you're saying is an accusation. So for example, TikTok is banned in China. We're th thinking, or people who want to ban it are thinking, wow, we're going to really defeat the Chinese communists by becoming Chinese authoritarians and banning it in our country. TikTok is banned in China. So we're going to emulate the Chinese communists by banning it in our country? No. It makes no sense whatsoever. Oh, hold, hold on, hold on. Let me just, let me just finish the question, though. It, I, 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 I think it's a false equivalence to say that a, for, a, the, a foreign adversary software is not allowed into the United States. We, we ban Huawei's uh, technology into the United States. There's lots of technology that you would ban into the United States because it's potentially malicious. Um, and would help our yeah, adversaries. But I the think question, Huawei, the question I think would Huawei, I think Huawei is banned from government use. And and from certain cell phone so systems TikTok. as well. And so is TikTok. And okay, I've so, actually, let me, let me just, let me just ask actually, the question. I've actually let me just, voted in on. favor. I've actually voted in favor of banning TikTok from government okay. devices 
as well as Huawei. So I think there's a difference between government advices and the private marketplace. Okay, fair. I'm not but in the on, business. Senator, just... I'm not. I'm not in the business of telling 180 million Americans they can't use uh, put dance videos up on TikTok. And if people okay, but, are, they just have to acknowledge that basically you're embracing the authoritarianism that China does to TikTok. You made the point in your book over and over and over again, and just now, that what that China lies. They are deceitful. Uh, they they act solely in their own best interest without regard to uh, what is right, what is fair, what is legal, what is honorable, on and on and on. Um, why should so we believe that? Is, is we're, we're why should we believe? Well, let me just finish the question. Why should we believe the them that your information is being shared with the Chinese government? There needs to be some proof that that's happening. Uh, no, my my, my what, accusation being, is, no, is that the Chinese have being, to. No, well, let me just be, no, can I just finish the question, being, sir? No, what's being alleged is that the Chinese government has the power to do this and could do this. Even you use the words that they could do this. No one's saying that it's happening. No one's presenting evidence that it's happening. So I think it's very important that people are innocent until proven guilty. There are international investors, including okay. Americans, who own this company, and you can't just take their property. Senator, I always admire your willingness to come on. You're a man of principle, um, applied uh, across the board without fear or favor. It's something we've always appreciated about you and admired about you through the years. We'll talk soon, sir. Thank you. Thank you. All right. We heard from a lot of you about our interview with Nancy Mace, the congresswoman from South Carolina and rape survivor who was attacked on air by ABC's George Stephanopoulos Sunday. I mean, it's disgusting to see how he handled this entire episode yesterday. Every woman in this country should be offended by the interview and then by the reaction the by the who are far left. Turns out ABC's George Stephanopoulos has a long history of attacking victims and defending known predators. He's so proud of it, in fact, He's let cameras record him doing it a lot, including all the way back when he worked for Bill Clinton and ran the war room in 1992. He is going to be president. Well, no, but I mean, don't think of it like that. Think of, let's take it at two levels. Number one, of course, it's not going to matter. But number two, think of yourself. I guarantee you that if you do this, you'll never work in Democratic politics again. That's Stephanopoulos talking to a campaign worker who planned on talking about a Clinton sex story on the radio. And he was at it again this Sunday on ABC's This Week. During an interview with Mace, right from the beginning, he went after her for being a rape survivor when attempting to ask her why she is supporting Donald Trump. I, I told my story. It took me 25 years to tell my story. I was judged for it. I still get judged for it today. I'm asking you a very simple question. It, and I answered Explain it. You're why, shaming no, me for I'm my not, political I'm not, choices. I'm asking you a question about why you endorse someone who's been found liable for rape. Just it was not a criminal court. This was, this it was, was a, a civil court. It was a civil court. And by rape. the way, she joked about the judgment and what she was going to do with all that money. And I find that offensive. I'm, hmm. And Megyn Kelly reacted to the interview. Here it is. I see how concerned you are that victims might not come forward if they are publicly attacked by their rapist or his defenders. To be sure, that is a very real concern. It happens all the time, which you know, because you invented it. Remember when you created a whole command center designed to smear Bill Clinton's sexual assault and rape accusers so you could elevate him right into the presidency. There's a bigger issue here beyond George Stephanopoulos and beyond Nancy Mace and certainly beyond Megyn Kelly. And that's the president of ABC News, Kim Godwin, the woman handpicked by Disney as the first black network news president in history. When it comes to defending women like Representative Mace, Godwin is missing in action. She used her position to put race, Trump, and other issues of social warriorism front and center She's making race and equity the centerpiece of her tenure at ABC News, the very same forces that came out of the Me Too movement. And there are some recent headlines about Kim Godwin that are worth reading. NY Post, embattled ABC boss Kim Godwin calls out Trump for saying black people like him because of indictments. She's no stranger to using her power at ABC. Wall Street Journal, inside Kim Godwin's challenging tenure as ABC News president, 
Yet when it comes to the shaming of a rape survivor on her network, she is deathly quiet. Haven't heard a word from her. She even allowed her Sunday show anchor to engage in the same political tricks he did during Bill Clinton's 1992 campaign. Nearly half of Americans personally know someone who has died of a drug overdose. New reporting on the snakehead gang from China shows we should be looking at Beijing way more, way more than at the Mexican border. We could do this story every day, and we probably should. The fentanyl crisis across America continues to get worse. Some video out of New York, San Francisco, Oakland, and Boston of Skid Row. What happens when people are high on drugs and fentanyl? Not sure about the video in the lower right-hand corner, but the other three videos make sense. We know that a lot of that fentanyl is coming from Mexico, but really the problem originates in China, where the precursor chemicals to the fentanyl come from. Forty-two percent of Americans, almost half, know an overdose victim personally. The fentanyl crisis has personally touched them with someone who has died. One hundred and eleven thousand three hundred eighty Americans. Died last year from overdoses. Half or more of those are from fentanyl, and a lot of them were quite literally murdered by the drug cartels. The Daily Mail just found out that the snakehead gangs are working with the Mexican cartels to bring Chinese into the United States. The snakeheads are known for human trafficking and counterfeit goods. They have a long history of bringing illegal Chinese migrants to Chinatowns all over the United States: New York, Los Angeles, on and on and on. They provide fake documents. To the illegal immigrants, in order to be able to work here in the United States, they coach them on what to say during their asylum interviews. When they come across the southern border, they get them lawyers, and now they're working with the Mexican cartels. Jen Smith is with us. Congratulations on your promotion to head of news at the Daily Mail. Thank you. Welcome to the program. Thank you. It's good to see you. Um, all right. Um, help us understand, and I think this is a, a, a reasonable question mm. to ask. Is this snakehead gang new, or is their involvement at the Mexican border new? The involvement at the Mexican border is very new. This gang, the Snakehead Gang, has been in operation around the world, Leland, for many years. We know that they were heavily involved in the human trafficking of people into the UK and other European countries. But what really is bombshell new information here is just their role in the southern border crisis. They are now joining the cartels and really taking advantage. Of the worsening situation and helping Chinese nationals come into the country illegally, they are coaching them on how to get there. They are meeting up with them in Tijuana. They are showing them literally the holes in the border wall, and then they're arranging once they get through to the other side for their lives in America. So this new element of the criminal gang at play from China working with the cartel. Is a、hmm. huge new fact of the border conversation. Now we always have known, or I shouldn't say always, but for a long time we have known the flow of fentanyl begins with the chemicals out of China into Mexico and then up、um, into the United States. Chinese migrants, many men of military age, are the fastest growing group、um, at the border.、Mm-hmm. Things in China don't happen.、Uh, In spite of the government, they happen because of the government. That's how China works.、Mm-hmm. Help us understand what the Chinese government is gaining, what this sort of what this gang is gaining when they bring all these migrants into the United States, and why they're doing it. Well, I wish I could tell you from their mouths, but you know it'll come as no surprise that when we were at the border and asked some of them, they didn't want to talk about it. Now、yeah. there are a million suggestions here. I mean, it's relevant to your last segment with Senator Paul. The just having a window into Americans' lives through the phones that we use in our hands—that's a huge concern. Now we don't know. It's what thirty-seven thousand Chinese migrants crossed the border into the U.S. last year illegally. We don't know why they're here, but what we found out is. They want to go back. Some of the migrants that we spoke to when we were in California, they told us that, oh yeah, I don't really want to talk to you too much because if I do, it'll risk my chances of going back to China at some point. That completely undercuts any claim of asylum, obviously.、Um, so, what, so what, what do they say they want to do? They do, they wouldn't say anything aside from no, I don't want to talk to you too much. I can't tell you how I got here aside from this Chinese guy. 
um, kind of helped me. And a few of them said that, you know, they got their information from TikTok. But no, you can't have my name. No, I don't want to tell you what my plans are. I'm eventually hoping to go back to China. And I'm scared if I talk too much to you, an American media company, they're not going to let me back in. Now, those are the ones who came illegally. There are others who present themselves legally at the border entry points and then use this CBP-1 app to obtain appointments with the government, and then right. they are allowed to stay. But again, the claims of asylum hugely undercut by the sheer fact that they come, first of all, with money. They're flying over. They are pretty well dressed. They're not the you know cash strapped desperate families uh, Jen, you normally see. Yeah, no, you you make make all great points. We got to run, unfortunately, but. Um, Thank you. Amazing what, amazing what a little journalism exposes. Keep it up. Coming up next, we still don't know the name of a Missouri teen who bashed the skull of a high school rival into the pavement. Somehow in our upside down world, the school labeled this bullying. How did almost killing someone become bullying? There's a young woman lying on the ground fighting for her life. She's now in critical condition. Just like that, though, the near deadly beating of a Hazelwood, Missouri high school student disappeared. There's no national media presence in Hazelwood, no breathless anchors rushing to do interviews in the town, no national demands for justice and change. In a larger sense, we see a growing disrespect for life among America's youth. Somehow, our streets and schools are modern day. Lord of the Flies. Missouri State Attorney General Andrew Bailey, once the teen charged as an adult and is with us now, Mr. Attorney General, appreciate it. We're going to get to the law in a minute. I have in front of me the response from the Hazelwood School District, uh, which ca- calls this uh, a tragedy. Anytime children are hurt, bullying and fighting in the community is an issue which we all need to take ownership with. Since when did bashing someone's head into a concrete street multiple times become bullying? Yeah, exactly. And I think, you know, what's absent from the district's statement is any kind of sympathy for the victim or personal accountability. The school system needs to do a better job of uh, preventing this kind of violence in the future. You know, my question is, What has the school done in reference to coordinating with safety resource officers, the police officers that are in school, and and working with the local juvenile officer to detect, investigate, and prevent this sort of behavior? The juvenile code exists not only to punish or find treatment for wrongdoers who violate the criminal code, but also for those who are beyond parental control, whose behavior is injurious to the welfare of the child or or the community at large. And so those are uh, status offenses that the juvenile uh, court can use to kind of uh, prevent this sort of issue in the future. And what resources were deployed and what role did the school play in that? I think those are unanswered questions that the school is clearly avoiding taking ownership of in its statement. Uh, one, one might imagine there could, could be some lawsuits coming out of this. As we understand it, there's not school resources officers in Hazelwood because of um, some dispute over training that may or may not uh, revolve around uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion um, issues. I'm wondering what you're thinking of the coverage of this. We, we saw this video, and obviously, as any person would be, even if you're not a parent, we're shocked um, and horrified of it. I looked at the St. Louis Post-Dispatch front page this morning. Uh, It was not among their top seven or eight stories. Um, Again, right now, I just checked again, not among their top seven or eight stories. Why do you think something like this, as awful and sickening as to watch, is not a bigger story? Well, I, I, I see this often, and my heart goes out to the victim. You know, this yeah. is a victim who is still suffering in critical condition in the hospital, as I understand it. And all too often, our system uh, loses track of, forgets, or n- neglects to uh, pay attention to the victims of these heinous offenses. And in the state of Missouri, victims have rights under our state constitution. Certainly, victims have procedural rights to address the court uh, when court proceedings are initiated and charges are filed. And that system, that process gets moving. So my heart goes out to the victim. And, and shame on the legacy media for not paying more attention to the victim and, and the victim's family. And there, so. Hmm. Yeah, well, for, for whatever it's worth, and even in the Hazelwood statement, um, they make no distinction between the, ber- vic- the victim and the perpetrator. Um, it, is, it is for everybody, our entire community. Um, 
on and on. Hazelwood's only a couple of miles from Ferguson. Um, I, I know Ferguson well is the fact that I, I lived there, uh, lived in St. Louis for a long time. Uh, obviously, Ferguson's the site of the 2014 Rockets, the start of the BLM um, movement. Uh, up until now, you nor I have mentioned the race of either the perpetrator or the victim. Is that plain in this case, you think? Yeah, it remains to be determined. I mean, you, you talk about uh, the instance where there are reports that have come forward that the safety re school resource officers aren't in the schools because of a dispute over DEI training. And I think, you know, to the extent that bears out and the school was prioritizing diversity, equity, inclusion training over having uniformed police officers in the school to prevent, deter and investigate criminal behavior. That's going to be a major tragedy that needs to be addressed. And what we see too often in the state of Missouri is that some of these school districts are pursuing these kind of ephemeral, uh, you know, subjective racial equality indices rather than educating children and paying attention to their needs. The juvenile court system, by statute, is required to serve the best interests of the child. My concern here is that uh, by allow by ignoring the culpability and accountability of a juvenile offender, we are not serving the best interest of the juvenile and i think too often that gets forgotten as well something that strikes me when i watch this video is how many people are watching and cheering and driving by and doing absolutely nothing how is it in missouri that a young woman having her head bashed into the street is commonplace well, I think that speaks to my point. I mean, look, when you have that many juveniles involved in that serious of an offense, there's no way this happened on accident. They were talking about it beforehand, and certainly we'll be talking about it afterward. And so where was the juvenile court system? Where was the juvenile officer in this process? Where were the school officials in this process? Surely there were some early warning signs that there was a conflict between these groups of, of uh, young uh, men and women. And, and so, you know, if they were exhibiting behavior injurious to themselves or others, or that, you know, they were beyond the, the control of their parents, the juvenile officer was required by law to step in and initiate proceedings uh, to try to prevent this kind of catastrophe from happening. And so I think this points to a larger breakdown in our system. Uh, currently, juvenile officers are under the purview and authority of the judiciary. Uh, it's like having an umpire picking the, the, the starting, you know, the batting order in a baseball game. We wouldn't tolerate that in any other system. It's time for reform in our juvenile justice system to add some accountability and transparency. Mr. Attorney General, we appreciate it. Yeah, you think if, if the school there was a massive failure and had they been interested in protecting kids, things might have been different. And also, each one of those people could have called 911, much less um, step in. So we'll, uh, I know you'll be continuing to follow the case, as will we. Thank you, sir. The White House wants to handcuff Israel to save President Biden. Michigan will show you the new risk that Hamas will win the war. Israel more than helping Israel by making the rest of the world. It's contrary to what Israel stands for. And I think it's a big mistake. All right. So that's President Biden explaining how he will explain Israel's new foreign policy. The president's justification for tightening the leash on Israel. He and his team clearly care more now about their domestic political agenda than they do the American hostages held by Hamas in Gaza. From Barack Ravid of Axios, there have been several discussions inside the administration in recent weeks about a possible military operation into Rafah. That's where the hostages are. And the bottom line was the Biden administration can't allow it to happen. Bachangar Sargon is here, opinion editor at Newsweek, author of the new book, as you can see behind her, Second Class. Congratulations on that. You know, Bachit, like, we understand what the domestic political considerations are here. How is it that the pro-Hamas wing of the Democratic Party and kudos to them, because this is politics. They got the world, and specifically in America, to focus entirely on the Palestinian suffering above ground in Gaza and to completely forget the hostages being raped, being tortured below ground in Gaza. It's a great question. I want to start by saying I completely support their right to do that as Americans, right? I don't want to be like the Democratic Party that only supports democracy when people agree with them. I don't agree with the ceasefire platform, but I 100% support the right of Muslim Americans to say we are going to turn this into our number one issue and we're going to organize around it. That is how democracy works. And like you said, Leland, kudos to them for doing that. The problem is, is that President Biden is now creating 
evading international foreign policy in order to speak to Dearborn. And what he's telegraphing to the rest of the world is, first of all, nonsense. The idea that I don't believe that Israel is losing somehow because they are defending their people, right? The idea that somehow they are sacrificing something more important by trying to eviscerate Hamas is ludicrous, right? They're doing the most important thing, which is trying to eliminate an enemy. But second of all, in doing this, in choosing this way to pursue this topic, President Biden is not only sort of betraying an ally, he's leaving on the table a much more effective way of both helping the Palestinians in Gaza and rescuing the hostages, which is putting pressure on Qatar. I don't understand why this is never on the table. It was Joe Biden who decided that Qatar would be a major non-NATO ally a year ago. What use is that if he's not going to use it in order to pressure them to help these people? Well, either pressure on Qatar or pressure on the Egyptians that we give billions upon billions to or pressure on the Jordanians that we give billions or billions to or pressure on the Turks and that are NATO allies. Look, President Biden seems to put the Palestinian suffering uh, all on Israel, um, which, is, which is interesting. And he's doing it for political reasons, as you pointed out. We all understand why. John Fetterman, uh, also of a state that is very important to Joe Biden, Pennsylvania, has a different look. Take a listen. I grieve for the loss of any innocent Palestinian, Israeli, Israeli soldiers, anyone. It's all tragic. And there is a lot of blood. But every drop of it belongs on the hands of Hamas and only with Hamas. He speaks to a working class group in Pennsylvania. Do they understand something about Hamas? I think that you can judge the American working class by looking at people who have the temperature, people like John Fetterman, and he is not afraid to say what he believes. And Mm. you can see that his polling is excellent, right? He's clearly speaking directly to his supporters. Yeah. Bacha, thank you very much. Unfortunately, we got to run. We'll talk soon. We'll also see if the the pro-ceasefire folks uh, about Gaza ever want to have any discussions about pro-ceasefire discussions on Haiti. That's tomorrow. Here's Chris. We are not supposed to be doing this. I'm giving Tucker Carlson a platform. I don't feel like I have anything to prove. Maybe there are forces trying to... Chris Cuomo. And we got a lot of people.